um, once Andrea is finished speaking. Okay. So um, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Professor Hilary Hallett, co-director of the Lehman Center, along with Professor Sam Roberts. And I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming everyone to the first event of the recently reopened Lehman Center, virtually, of course. Um, we could not be more delighted to have distinguished attorney, author, activist, and public intellectual Andrea Ritchie kick off what we know will be a powerful and thought-provoking year of events with a talk from her most recent book, Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. But before I introduce today's event and Richie, I'd like to open up by saying a few words about the Lehman Center and the context that led us to launch this series and two others we are running. And then to thank the other campus institutes that helped make this event possible. Uh, the Lehman Center for American History is a collaboration between the Rare Books and Manuscript Library and the Department of History and is dedicated to supporting and enhancing the study and teaching of history here at Columbia. After being closed for renovations, the Lehman Center has reopened during what can only be called an almost unbearably fraught and historic moment in the United States. Today, we are finding ourselves grappling with at least three intersecting crises, an impending presidential election in which the most basic democratic rights like voting and the peaceful transition of power are under siege, a devastating pandemic that has already claimed over 200,000 lives in this country and has disproportionately impacted communities of color and the most vulnerable populations in our country. And of course, we are also in the midst of an unprecedented uprising and reckoning over police violence and racial injustice in this nation. The movement for racial justice and police accountability has at times appeared like the one bright spot in this dark year. And at others like today, in the wake of the decision not to charge the officers who murdered Breonna Taylor, it has felt like a series of tragedies with no justice and no end in sight. All the historians at the Lehman Center believe it is our responsibility to use the research that we do and the scholarship that we engage with to confront these historic crises by examining the histories that help us understand how we got where we are today in order to help us clarify the best paths forward. To that end, we're excited to announce three overlapping series of public events sponsored by the Lehman Center this year that flow from these ongoing crises. The first is a series of lectures organized by Professor Roberts on the theme of race, health, and inequality. Earlier this month, we co-organized a powerful discussion with Dr. Harriet Washington at the Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn about what the legacy of African-American health inequities can tell us about today's COVID-19 pandemic. Later this fall, on November 18th, we'll have the second lecture in this series from Marsha Chatelain whose work on black fast food franchise owners offers important insight into race, health, economics, and food justice. The second set of talks that I've organized along with our fabulous, fabulous graduate research assistant, Nikita Shepard, and the help, I should say, of Emma Scheinbaum, communications and development director in the history department, pivots around the theme of American politics, American identities, and explores a range of new scholarship about the many different ways that race has structured American electoral politics. This fall will feature Geraldo Cadava's work on the shaping of Hispanic Republican voters from Nixon to Trump, Martha Jones's vanguard on black women's fights for suffrage and equality, and Columbia Provost Ira Katz Nelson's work on the broader shift to white supremacist politics in the US Congress after Reconstruction. Finally, our talk today is also the first event in the Policing America series that the Lehman Center will be running all this year. Given the larger racial reckoning in our culture at this moment, we felt that it was essential to highlight critical scholarship on the history of policing, race, and resistance in the United States to understand the origins of this crisis that have led not only to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many thousands more, 
but also the kinds of sexual violence and abuse that too often still falls outside of the conventional narrative about the topic of police misconduct. On November 5th, Simon Balto will speak about his powerful book on policing Black Chicago, Occupied Territory. And please look out for more talks in the spring by historians as we continue our deep dive on the histories that explain our current carceral crisis in the United States. Our goal then at the Lehman Center in this historic year is to help catalyze conversations at Columbia within the history department and across the campus and Barnard about how history can help inform our research, writing, teaching, advocacy, and the more just futures that we want to create. And now before I introduce Andrea Ritchie, I just wanna take a moment to thank the co-sponsors at Columbia who made today's event possible. So on behalf of myself, my co-director Sam Roberts, the associate director Ty Jones, and our graduate intern Nikita Shepard, a big thanks to the Institute for Research in African American Studies, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought, and by the way, their first event in their Abolition 1313 series will take place later this evening for those of you who are interested the Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Law, and the Institute for the Study of Human Rights. I encourage all of you who are here tuning in today to check out their activities. We'll put links in the chat so that everyone who's interested can learn more about the work that they're doing. So, on to our real event. It is a very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, distinguished police misconduct attorney, organizer, activist, researcher, writer, and all-around feminist, anti-racist, social justice warrior, Andrea Ritchie, who has worked for more than two decades to challenge abusive and discriminatory policing against women, girls, and LGBTQ people of color on all fronts. Ritchie is currently serving a second term as a researcher in residence at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, where she continues her work deepening conversations and movements around policing and mass incarceration. Previously, she was a Soros Justice Fellow at the Open Society Foundations, where she documented policy reforms and litigation strategies that address the specific ways in which discriminatory policing impacts women of color. As a nationally recognized expert on policing, policing issues, she has worked with social justice groups across the country to support campaigns to end profiling, police violence, criminalization, mass incarceration, and deportation. A proud graduate of Howard Law School, Richie has also been lead counsel on many groundbreaking cases, several involving transgender rights. She has drafted and negotiating sweeping changes in the NYPD's policies for interactions with LGBTQ New Yorkers, and has since supported organizations and law enforcement agencies across the country in developing policies around police interactions with Black women and girls and LGBTQ people of color. Her articles and opinion pieces have been published in numerous anthologies and media outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Guardian, The Root, and she regularly appears on national media outlets including HBO, BET, and NPR. And finally, Andrea Ritchie is the author or co-author of three books, Say Her Name, What It Means to Center Black Women's Experience of Police Violence, Surviving the Streets of New York, experiences of LGBTQ youth, YMSM and YWSW engaged in survival sex, and of course, most recently, Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. Remarkably, Invisible No More is the first full-length publication to tackle issues of profiling, policing, and criminalizations of communities of color through the lens of women's experiences and to uplift over two decades of resistance to police violence centering on women, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming people of color. Although Richie is quick to say that she is not an historian, I would argue that like the best revisionist histories, Invisible No More helps us see an existing subject in an entirely fresh light by asking new questions and looking at fresh evidence. So please join me in welcoming Andrea Ritchie to the Lehman Center. Thank you so much, Hillary and uh, Dr. Roberts and Nikita and all of you for joining us today. I'm going to attempt to speak and share my screen at the same time, which is gonna be 
I think a challenge, but um, it might work. Um, so just before I start, um, I just wanted to say that um, in addition to the things that um, Dr. Hallett uh, said about me, which were all very kind and uh, generous, um, I am a black woman, I am a lesbian, I'm an immigrant, I'm a survivor of state and interpersonal violence. And I say those things in part because they're not immediately apparent from looking at me, but also sometimes, um, but also because they deeply inform the work that I do and the communities that I'm part of. In addition to the affiliations um, that Dr. Hallett outlined, I'm also a uh, member of the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table. I'm a co-founder of something called the In Our Names Network, which is a network of organizations across the country working to end police violence against black women, girls, queer and trans people, and um, have been part of Communities United for Police Reform, one of the founding steering committee members there in New York City for the um, during the time of stop and frisk. So um, wanted to lift up the movements that have shaped me and formed me and I'll talk more about some of those as well. And then also um, note that the Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women report um, that Dr. Hallett mentioned is one that I co-authored with Columbia's own Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, which was my tremendous privilege and honor. So as has already been indicated, today's conversation could not be more timely. I didn't expect it to be this timely as the we're literally engaged in a national conversation about what justice for Breonna Taylor could or should look like and is um, and how that's not manifesting in this moment. Um, this uh, is a moment that has been generated by organizers on the ground and um, as indicated in this uh, graphic notes from our In Our Names Network gathering in July when we heard a report uh, from folks on the ground, including Rachel Williams, who was one of the founders of the network. Um, this is a moment that has been produced and generated by Tamika Palmer, Breonna Taylor's mom, who's also an essential worker, who really didn't think people would care or throw down around her daughter and was holding down so much already for her family. Um, and her only day off was the day of Brianna's burial at the time um, that we had this conversation in July, it just really have been at the core and the root of this moment that we're in right now. And so what this graphic illustrates among many other things is that at the base, at the root has been black women who stepped in, some of whom had lost uh, their children to police violence, their daughters, their um, sons, their, trans and gender non-conforming children to police violence who stepped in and said, uh, we got you, we're gonna hold you down, we're gonna make this happen. And then uh, BLM Louisville has been in the streets every day um, since March around Breonna Taylor's killing and, um, and at the very least since May and when uh, the information that was necessary to organize came to light and continue to be in the streets and continue to be facing um, repression last night as, and this morning. So just wanted to name that um, about this moment, um, that we are in a moment created by Black women on the ground who are directly impacted by police violence and state violence. And to say that the name of my book, um, Invisible No More, is both um, a statement of fact, a demand, and an aspiration. And so the truth is that Breonna Taylor's killing and murder by the Louisville Police Department is in fact invisible no more in a way that 25 years ago when I began this work, or actually over 30 years ago when I began this work, or when Eleanor Bumpers, for instance, was killed by New York City Police Department in 1986, also in her home, um, as she was as part of an eviction from public housing not far from where Columbia is. Um, her story, her case, her uh, quest for her family's quest for justice just did not command the same level of attention. People organized in New York City, uh, but celebrities were certainly not talking about it. Basketball teams were not wearing their her name on their jersey. The U.S. Open players didn't have her name on their um, well, they didn't have face masks, but in their um, view. And we just are in a place where police violence against Black women and women of color and queer and trans people. Um, is in fact invisible no more. That is a statement of fact. It's also a demand in the sense that 
in many circles, we still hear people say that, you know, George Floyd is, uh, in the words of one person I heard say this recently, the reason for the season, and I, I had to step in and say George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, the hundreds of people killed since they've all been killed by police um, are the reason for the season. So there's still places where Breonna's name is not said in the conversation about police violence that's happening right now. Um, and it continues to be an aspiration um, in the sense that while our names may be more visible in the conversation, the specific and unique ways in which we experience police violence and the systemic forces that drive it are not necessarily shaping our response to it in the same way. And so there's still a lot of work to be done on this front that I'll get to uh, throughout this conversation. Um, and for the historians um, in the crowd, and I, I agree that I am not one and I get to learn from incredible historians like Sarah Haley, Talitha LaFluria, Mariam Kaba, my colleague at Interrupting Criminalization, uh, Cynthia Blair, I could just go on, Claire Sears, there are so many um, from whom I have learned uh, um, what I know about resistance. I just wanna name also that black women have always insisted um, are that our deaths and our violations by the state not be invisible, that they be at the center of our organizing. So that's been true, not only of the black women leading the work in Louisville or of Janae Bonsu, who's on the cover of the book and the organization uh, she's representing there, BYP 100, and many others who um, have been demanding justice in the current context of the post-Ferguson era, specifically for black women, girls, queer and trans people, but also for organizations like Insight that has shaped me um, politically, which was formed looking at the dangerous intersections or out of the dangerous intersections between state and interpersonal violence at which black women, queer and trans people live and struggle and fight and um, has come out with a, you know, a lot of the politics that informed this work, my work and elsewhere. Um, also, the women of the civil rights movement, as impeccably documented in At the Dark End of the Street, if you haven't read the book, you must all absolutely, um, shows that the women of the civil rights movement, in many cases, came together to fight state violence against Black women. Um, Rosa Parks was part, before she refused to get up uh, from her seat on the bus, of a committee called the Committee in Defense of Gertrude Perkins, a Black woman who was raped by two Montgomery police officers several years before the Montgomery bus boycott began. And um, in the course of the civil rights movement, national organizations, including the National Council of Negro Women and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, among many others, came together in national conferences to document and talk about how to address the question of sexual violence by law enforcement agents against freedom riders, against civil rights organizers, against black power organizers. And so, and then to go further back, Ida B. Wells, was very clear about the need to document uh, lynching, not only of black men, but also of black women, because black women's lives mattered, but also because it disrupted the notion that lynching was about rape of white women. And in fact, we emphasized that it was about maintaining the relationships of power established uh, in slavery and colonialism. So for black women, we've always been organizing and our lives have not been invisible to each other. And that is replicated, I think we see in the current moment quite clearly. The demand on the streets has been to say her name. Um, and again, it's not, we need to start at saying her name and not stop there. Um, we need to understand what drives um, police violence and what killed all of the people whose names are on this poster who are far from all the people who have been killed by police who are black women, girls, queer, trans people, certainly even since 2015, the, the, that poster was made before Sandra Bland, who's not on there, for instance. Um, so it's also a way of illustrating that this is a, an issue that long precedes Sandra Bland, that long precedes the, the current sort of framing that the Ferguson uprising has given us um, and certainly our resistance has also long preceded that. Um, and that we wanna talk about the ways in which um, our experiences of police violence are very similar to those um, of men who 
the story of police violence is very much focused on the experiences of black and brown men who are assumed to be cisgender, who are assumed to be heterosexual. That's the lens through which we understand police and state violence. To the extent that we do talk about someone like Sandra Bland, it's sort of seen as the exception, a sort of detour from the main story. And then, you know, we return to the main story where all of the actors are presumed to be um, cisgender heterosexual men. Um, and then we also experience um, things that are very uh, different or unique or gender specific. Um, so I want to say about that become more visible when we don't simply lift up the killing, police killing of an unarmed black person as sort of the gold standard of what state violence is. And even when we do that, while the numbers of black women killed by police are certainly smaller than those of black men killed by police, the racial disparities in the police killings among women are identical to those among men, as are the racial disparities in arrests among women as they are among men. And sometimes they're more significant, particularly when it comes to arrests of black girls in schools, for instance, and in certain categories of um, criminalization. And then also, um, in fact, there's a study that, um, shows that in terms of even when we look at this gold standard of you know killing of unarmed black people it, depending on how you analyze the data the black women are the group most likely to be killed by police when they're unarmed than any other demographic group including black men and so in terms of um risk rates or or how likely that is compared to population and compared to the number of killings and so what we understand from that is that while we're clear about the ways in which black men or, or men of color are perceived as a threat, um, we're less clear about the fact that black women, what that stat would indicate is that black women are perceived as an even greater threat when unarmed, when sleeping in their bed, when um, a young girl at school, when no matter what they're doing, whether they're calling for help, whether they're seeking assistance, whether they are simply as Sandra Blinn was saying, why do I have to put my cigarette out when I'm in my own car? And so, uh, history teaches us where that comes from. It teaches us about the controlling narratives that were evolved and uh, spread and duplicated and which has, you know, evolved over time that framed Black women as inherently dangerous, um, as inherently threatening, as inherently animalistic, as inherently deranged, that justified the ways in which chattel slavery abused, violated their bodies, um, devalued their motherhood, was premised on systemic sexual violence. Um, all of that was um, those was perpetrated by stories and narratives about black women that continue to inform their police interactions with them to this day. So that is um, what history teaches us and, and what history can help shape in terms of um, how we resist or how we respond. What is, um, I want to sort of spend some time talking about um, Breonna Taylor's case today as sort of illustrative um, and indicative of some larger trends in um, killings and violations and abuses and criminalization of black women, girls, queer and trans people. And I want to do that in a way that recognizes that Breonna Taylor is unique. She's a, she was a unique person who held a special place in her family, in her community, who is a human of value in and of herself, whose experience, um, including up to her killing, was unique and um, needs to be lifted up and valued as that. And we can see in her case some trends that are consistent across, for instance, many of the uh, stories reflected by the unique experiences of the women whose uh, names appear here, and that can be instructive in terms of how we resist. So one, I want to name, uh, people often say to me, well, why are Black women's experiences so much more invisible than um, other members of Black communities? There are many answers to that, but one of them is true in this case, which is that often police violence against Black women takes place indoors, behind closed doors, in private spaces, often in the context of calls for help. So many of the names you see on this list um, were killed, pe are people who were killed when family members or the people themselves called for help because they um, 
needed assistance and the help that society sends more often than not is police when other things might be needed. So many folks might have heard of a Tatiana Jefferson, for instance, who was killed by uh, Fort Worth police in the context of a neighbor saying, I see a door open, I'm concerned for her safety. And the result was that a Tatiana Jefferson wound up dead. Um, Sharice Francis, for instance, is a name on this list of a, is a New York young woman who wound up dead after police were responding to a call for help from her family because she was um, had some unmet mental health needs and was in distress. That's true for many of the folks on this list. Another name on this list is Frankie Perkins, um, who, and another uh, name I think is Danette Daniels um, on this list. They are people who were killed in the context of the war on drugs, which is another sort of common theme that runs through Breonna Taylor's killing and many of the killings um, and other forms of violation that black women, girls, queer and trans people experience. So we all know that the officers who killed Breonna Taylor were at her door um, to enact a no-knock drug uh, warrant and that that is a central tool of the war on drugs. And the war on drugs is actually one of the primary drivers, both of mass incarceration of black women and girls and of police interactions with black women and girls and queer and trans people and of police killings of black women, girls, queer and trans people. So for instance, Frankie Perkins and Annette Daniels were both choked to death by police officers who believed that they had swallowed um, or can somehow consumed or concealed drugs in their bodies. And both of them, that happened in broad daylight in front of a lot of people. So it wasn't a question of something that happened behind closed doors, but it was something that was a question of the war on drugs. It was something that looked a lot like what happened to George Floyd, didn't get the same attention at the time, um, but shows a through line um, and a continued trend of how these themes are reproducing themselves over time. The war on drugs that drove those cops to um, Breonna Taylor's door is definitely um, a primary site of police killings. I sadly can tell you that Breonna Taylor was not even the first black woman who was killed in a no-knock drug raid like that. Um, Katherine Johnson is a 92-year-old black woman who was killed in a no-knock drug raid in Atlanta in 2016, I believe. Um, she was in a neighborhood where like Brianna, you know, there was danger. She had heard other people had um, experienced violence. She got herself a very rusty old pistol in the hopes that she could defend herself if someone came to her door. Another elderly woman was raped in her neighborhood shortly before police came banging through her door in the middle of the night. Similarly, she had uh, no idea who they were. She pulled out what she thought would maybe protect her and uh, they shot her dead in her, the doorway of her own home. I could name several other women who have had similar experiences. Um, Tarika Wilson um, in this shot is in exactly or a similar pose to the one she was in when she was killed when police officers barged into her home on a no-knock drug warrant and shot her while she was holding her um, young child. Um, Alberta Spruill is another black woman who was killed by police in New York City in the context of a no-knock drug raid. In her case, they threw a flashbang grenade into her apartment before coming in and uh, it caused her to have a heart attack. So there certainly are um, many ways that um, uh, the drug war um, kills people. It's not only um, by shootings, for instance, in the case of Alberta Spruill, it's also something that helps that, um, sorry, that contributes to police killings of black people with this, who are disabled. Um, Lakeisha Turner, is a young disabled black woman who was in her home when there was a drug raid that also involved tear gas and flashbang grenades. And the police ordered her to get out of the house. And of course um, she could not because she used a wheelchair and couldn't get out of the room that she was in. And so they left her there and the inhalation of fumes is something that contributed to a health condition that killed her several months later. Lisa Hayes, also a disabled black woman who um, was in a home that was targeted in a violent drug raid by law enforcement who experienced ableist violence in that context. So it's not always fatal, um, but certainly it's violative and often physical violence and criminalization that results. I also want to name that it's not always a raid. Um, Shelley Treasure Hilliard is a black trans woman who was arrested by police for trading sex and then the one blunt she uh, they found on her 
um, they decided to use to threaten her with arrest, which for black trans women is guaranteed uh, exposure to tremendous violence in sex segregated facilities where they're often placed um, according to the, their anatomy or sex assigned at birth rather than their gender identity or their safety. And um, knowing that that was an option that almost guaranteed violence when they offered her another option, which was to wear a wire for a drug deal um, in order to catch um, the person who had sold her the blunt, she took that option and the police cared so little for her black trans life that they told the person who had um, worn the wire on him and uh, Shelley turned up dead um, in a very, very violent and disturbing way um, later on. And so there's so many ways in which the war on drugs is deadly for black women, um, girls, queer and trans people that involves no knock drug raids, but also involves, again, this choking to death on public streets that involves um, the physical violence of the raids and that involves also this question of um, trying to use black women as informants or um, using them to pressure or flip other people that can make them be at risk of violence by other folks in the drug trade or community. It's not always uh, physical or fatal violence that um, happens in the context of the war on drugs. Sexual violence is also a feature of the war on drugs. It's not an exception. Um, certainly that can take the form of um, uh, cavity searches and strip searches of Black women like Sharnesia Corley, who are um, presumed or expected to be vessels for drugs that are consumed or carried or concealed in some way. And um, in her case, uh, the sort of still you see on the right hand side is a dash cam video showing um, an officer conducting a cavity search of Sharnesia in full public view at a Houston gas station. Um, for a total of 11 minutes, according to the um, dash cam video. And the original contact was that she, the officer claimed she ran a stop sign, which I don't know anyone who's driven a vehicle who hasn't done that before, or at least rolled through it. And his next allegation was that he smelled weed um, when he stopped her. And in fact, she was on the way to the store to pick up some medication for her grandmother. And that was the, the essentially state sanctioned rape that was, um, perpetrated on her in the name of the war on drugs. And so that's another way in which the war on drugs is waged on the bodies of black women um, that we don't talk about. We also don't talk about sexual violence as a form of police violence. And it often takes place both um, alongside um, physical and fatal violence. Um, and it can also be a precursor. So many of you might've heard that Brett Hankinson, the officer who um, was charged yesterday and, and who um, was terminated for killing Breonna Taylor, um, had once his picture appeared in the paper, five women came forward to say, this guy has sexually assaulted, extorted, coerced, or uh, raped me. And you know, the, we either reported it and nothing had been done about it or they hadn't come forward for fear of retaliation and not being believed because he's a police officer. And all of that is extremely common. Um, and the war on drugs certainly creates conditions um, that make it more possible both for uh, state sanctioned sexual assault in strip searches and cavity searches on the streets, at airports. There's certainly been cases documented at JFK up until including very recently, and also um, extortion of sex in exchange for leniency because mandatory minimums uh, make it such that an officer can say, look, you know, I can either charge you with this offense that's going to carry 25 years to life, uh, you'll lose your children, your job, your family, your freedom or you'll do this for me. And um, certainly we saw that, for instance, in New York City in the case of Anna Chambers was um, what happened there. So I want to name the war on drugs as really a primary site of police violence against Black women. And Breonna Taylor's case certainly is um, the, the extreme version of the result of that. So if we are to say Breonna Taylor's name, we need to say that we need to end the war on drugs in the same breath. That is what justice for Breonna Taylor looks like. That's what um, ensuring that there'll be no more Breonna Taylors, Tarika Wilson's, Alberta Spruill's, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Katherine Johnson's, Frankie Perkins, Danette Daniels, and Chinese Corley's as just a few of the names um, that, as we're saying, demand that in their names we end the war on drugs. 
You might also have heard that um, from folks organizing in Louisville and in the press that gentrification was also behind um, the what was also one of the forces that brought the police officers to Brianna's door, that there's an effort to um, turn the neighborhood that she's living um, to shift the economic, uh, I don't know what to call it, like a blueprint of it or <laughs> to shift the, um, the use of it and who's present in it, what kinds of bodies are present in it, what kinds of bodies are framed as disorderly, so that even, you know, it doesn't kind of matter whether Brianna, whether there was any drugs or anything involved um, in her home, which her family is very clear that there were not, there were no drugs found, there was nothing to do with drugs uh, found, but the, the fact is that it kind of doesn't matter in the sense that the police were there to clear out a neighborhood and to make it, to prepare it for um, other people, other kinds of economic activity and that that is something that originated in New York City called broken windows policing um, and it's something that is happening across the country um, as a way of sort of clearing neighborhoods of the consequences of economic decisions, policies, organized abandonments of communities, um, the, the responses if there's then people who are unhoused and we're certainly seeing this in the Upper West Side and New York right now in the incident with the Lucerne Hotel, people who are unhoused, even if they're then housed in a hotel, are still seen and perceived as inherently signs of disorder. This article names unhoused people as a sign of disorder and that they must be removed from communities um, in order to make them, quote unquote, safer for certain classes and types of people, including the wealthy and extremely privileged residents of the Upper West Side who don't need to worry about their housing or how to stay safe in a pandemic and are challenging other people's ability to do that. Um, other people who are named as signs of disorder in this theory and in policing of gentrification and broken windows policing are black women who um, in this article, I think are described as uh, women standing on corners in short shorts. But you know, that again, sort of lifts up historical narratives of black women as inherently sexually deviant, as inherently engaged in prostitution or lewd conduct or some kind of moral degradation by our mere presence, our mere physical presence in a neighborhood signals some kind of disorder and moral degradation that must be responded to with sweeps and criminalization. And certainly we've seen that in New York City, including in the course of the pandemic, where police officers assume that if black women are standing outside on a corner, keeping in mind that black women make up the bulk of essential workers and certainly healthcare workers, if they're doing that when there's a stay at home order in place, then they must be out there for some illicit uh, purpose including engaging in, in the sex trade and, and then for people who are engaged in the sex trade who have no choice um, but to be outside when online platforms are being shut down, for instance, um, are then being picked up and put into greater risk of exposure by being put in jail as part of this sort of clearing the streets and keeping them you know, clean of um, threats of disorder. So just wanted to name that's another thread and, and that there's a, we talk a lot about broken windows policing. We talk a lot about stop and frisk. That's part of that. Um, we don't often talk about the ways in which it specifically and intentionally targets black women's bodies, black queer and trans bodies in public spaces um, in the same way that we talk about how it tar targets, you know, young black and brown men, which is sort of the way we've talked about stop and frisk and policing and gentrification in New York City. So I just wanted to expand that conversation. Um, and finally, you know, when I say that um, that uh, police violence against, including fatal violence against black women, uh, girls, queer and trans people often happens in away from public eyes, away from cop watching cameras, um, inside, indoors, um, and in ways that are invisible, that includes the criminalization of survivors of domestic and sexual violence who call for help and instead um, experience like a, a lack of protection or neglect in such a way that they are exposed to further violence. Um, and when police do respond, criminalization, physical violence, sexual violence, sexual extortion, um, and often fatal violence. So many of the names on the um, list that you saw earlier, the poster you saw earlier, are survivors who called for help in domestic violence situations and were shot and killed by police instead. So while that was not the case in, in Breonna Taylor's uh, uh, case, it is the case for so many um, women, queer and trans people who suffered her fate. And of course, you know, the, the thread too that comes through and um, 
as I said earlier, maybe, um, maybe I didn't say this, but you know, the, the investigation report that uh, the, the, of the police investigation to Brianna's killing that, you know, formed the basis of, you know, part of the decision that was um, announced yesterday, the incident report said no one was injured in the incident in which Brianna Taylor was gunned down in a hail of bullets as she lay in her bed and bled to death in her own bed. And that is a theme also that's common throughout um, all of sort of the stories of police violence and violation against black women, girls, queer and trans people, which is um, that, you know, black women may be essential workers um, as Brianna and her mother and other black women, you know, killed by police or harmed by police are, they're essential to um, the foundation of a society, to care work in this moment, to survival of the pandemic, to getting us through, um, through childcare or healthcare or, um, service workers or other um, postal workers essential to the foundation of society, yet disposable in death. And that's true whether it's police violence or whether it's COVID deaths. Um, and that is certainly a pattern um, that, you know, runs through Breonna Taylor's case and, and so many other cases in this moment and so many other sort of consequences of structural um, relations of power. So I did want to say again that, you know, uh, Breonna Taylor's case is unique to her and to her family and not isolated and that it illustrates many patterns that are consistent throughout history in terms of um, state violence against black women, girls, queer and trans people and um, that those things are not necessarily lifted up in larger conversations either about police violence or about violence against women and that's uh, or gender-based violence and so that is really where um, the aspiration and the demand of invisible no more remains which is that we want um, to make sure that we're striking at root causes and when we look at police violence through the lens of the experiences of black women queer and trans people we come much more quickly to abolition. And we do that because black women, girls, queer and trans people experience police violence in every situation, including those in which we think police should be protecting or are protecting people's safety. That means when they're responding to domestic violence calls, that means when they're responding to sexual violence calls, that means when they're responding to calls like the one Charlena Lyles made to say her home had been burglarized, that call ended with her death. Kiwi Herring is a black trans woman who was shot by police in a call that had to do with tremendous violent homophobia and transphobia she and her partner were experiencing over the course of six months um, that the night before had culminated in her neighbor setting fire to her porch. But when the police responded, the person who wound up dead was Kiwi Herring. And so all of that tells us police are not protecting us. They are not keeping us safe. They are increasing the risk of violence in our lives and they're doing nothing to prevent, intervene, interrupt um, the violence in our lives. And so we get much more quickly when we think about root causes um, of police violence to the need to dismantle the system, to defund the system, to divest from the system, to dismantle the system because the system is not only failing to protect us, but it's looting the resources that we need to keep ourselves safe. Their law enforcement gets $100 billion a year um, annually for decades. And meanwhile, shelters don't have enough money. People who are unhoused don't have enough money. Uh, child care workers don't have enough money. We don't have PPE for nurses who are literally saving our lives in a pandemic. Uh, teachers are being forced into conditions that are unsafe in New York City. Um, and we don't have resources supposedly to come up with a different way of conducting education that is healthy for children, families, communities, and instructors. Um, because all of that money in most cities, including in New York City, as you know, a billion dollars in New York City goes to the police department. Sorry, six billion dollars. Six billion dollars. Six billion with a B dollars in New York City go to policing. And specifically to the NYPD, not to policing as a whole, not to all the other ways policing happens in New York City, just to the NYPD. And so that $1 billion could save a lot of lives in a pandemic, 
could ensure that many of us will survive the economic crisis that the pandemic is bringing and certainly could help us strengthen ourselves to meet the conditions that Dr. Hallett talked about at the beginning where we are in a, in a moment of deep crisis in terms of um, the structures of this country. So um, when we start thinking that way, we really need to think about um, defunding police, dismantling institutions that hurt, uh, kill us, harm us, investing in, in institutions that actually produce genuine safety and conditions under which we can survive and thrive. What's important about that and what this article gets at that Mariam Kaba, who is uh, my fellow researcher in residence at the Barnard Center for Research on Women and my co-founder of the Interrupting Criminalization Initiative, is that that means we need to divest from those systems even when we think they, or when we want justice for when they harm us. And so it means we have to divest from policing, not just financially, but ideologically and emotionally. And we need to understand um, the system is not set up to provide justice for black women. It, it is not set up to provide justice for people who are harmed by police, whether, um, you know, no matter what the conditions are, and that continuing to turn to that system to seek accountability and justice when that is in fact the system that killed us or harmed us or promoted or condoned the, the policies and practices that resulted in our harm and killing is, is not certainly strategic, um, but also is politically inconsistent um, with our dreams of building a world of genuine safety, survival and thriving for black women and girls. And so in this article, we argue that in fact, we should be um, looking for reparations. We should be looking for other solutions that strike at root causes. We can talk more about those in Q&A. Um, I just wanted to wrap up by saying that what this means, what reparations looks like, what accountability looks like, what striking at the root causes looks like, in the, name, in the words of the leaders on the ground who we talked about at the beginning, including Brianna's family and BLM Louisville is immediately firing without pension all of the officers who killed Brianna. It means defunding, divesting, dismantling the police department that killed her. That is the ultimate accountability, is that if a department is going around killing people, then we get rid of the department. Um, and investing in the things that would keep people like Brianna and her community safe. Um, that we look not beyond individual officers, we look at the larger system and who's accountable and responsible for the larger systems that um, contribute to these killings. Um, and that we uh, understand police violence when we think about violence, because I think, you know, I'm sure this will come up in Q&A. Sure, sounds great, Andrea, but you know, what about gun violence? Someone once said to me um, in a conversation about this case, you know, but what do we do about home invasions if we defund the police? And I, I was genuinely confused for a minute. I was like, wait, do you mean the home invasion that killed Breonna Taylor? Is that the home invasion that you're talking about? Because I don't take that home invasion out of the equation when I'm thinking about home invasions. Um, and also know that police do nothing um, to intervene or interrupt or stop or protect people from home invasions. At best, they show up after the fact. So um, understanding also that when police kill someone, that's also gun violence. So people say, yes, but look, you know, all this defunding and the gun violence is going up. I think one, gun violence is going up under current conditions with the police getting, you know, in charge. Um, and secondly, police violence is gun violence. 10% of gun violence committed every year is committed by police. And so if we want to slow down gun violence, we need to address one of the sources, which are police. So those are the demands of, um, folks on the ground in Louisville. I encourage folks, one, today, if you can, to donate to the bail fund, um, because that, um, uh, as you, you can see on the internet, on Twitter, um, police arrested hundreds of people last night, they incredibly violently. So it's not just about bailing people out, but it's also about supporting people in healing and repair and time off work or lost jobs or all the things that come with experiencing that kind of police violence. Many of you might have experienced it in New York as you were protesting or just in your community generally. So you know the drill. So the bail fund there is, is supporting folks um, beyond just bailing them out. Um, and then you can find all the demands I listed there at investdivest.org. So please encourage folks in your community when you see them lifting up sort of demands articulated by people who are not on the ground in Louisville or accountable to them or referencing them or pointing people to them or supporting them, please intervene and say, you know, it's, 
I love ex celebrity. I think that they're great and they're not on the ground. So folks on the ground in Louisville have been clear for a long time that they weren't going to get justice from the department that killed Breonna Taylor um, for her killing. And so they've evolved these demands with that knowledge and um, with a desire to obtain genuine justice for Breonna. This lines up with national demands to defund police. Um, and as we say in this publication that we put together, the Interrupting Criminalization Initiative um, and uh, disseminated through the Movement for Black Lives, we don't just want to defund the police, we want to fund the people and defend black lives. So you can learn more, and I'll drop the link in the chat uh, during Q&A about how communities across the country are doing this. And then also, what, what does community safety look like? You know, people are like, well, what are the alternatives to police? In fact, some things don't require another form of policing in a different form, it requires housing, it requires jobs, it requires health care, requires transport, it requires child care, it requires mental health needs being met in multiple ways without stigma in multiple places. It requires um, a lot people with skills to intervene in conflict, all of us to have understanding about how we de-escalate between ourselves, between our neighbors, between our relationships and our families, how do we resolve conflict? How do we prevent conflict? How do we recognize signs that sexual or other kinds of harm or gender-based harm are happening? How do we prevent them, interrupt them, create a culture in which they're not possible? Um, that's the world that we're building and we don't have $100 billion to do it. So what I wanna say to close is that I, I have the terrible news to deliver to you that I don't have a fully formed plan of what a world without police looks like. Neither does Mariam, even though she's probably closest of many of us. Um, but that's something that we're all going to be, um, I want to invite all of us to build together, that we have the tools in our hands to build that um, in our day-to-day -day interactions and practice and in our visions for the world that we want to create on the other side of the portal that we are in right now that is manifesting more and more clearly every day. Um, and just invite you all to join with me and so many more in building and fighting for and creating and manifesting a world where Breonna Taylor would still be with us because that is the only world in which there's truly justice for Breonna Taylor. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, this would be the point in pre-COVID times when there would be resounding applause, deafening applause would be reaching your ears. And, um, but, uh, and I see some digital hands, uh, digital applause hands are being raised here. Thank you to our audience for that. And Andrew, thank you again um, for these, these words of insight and, and hope at uh, what's really a dark time right now. Um, it's, it's a real honor and pleasure. Um, I'm very fortunate that we could have you here to speak with us. We're gonna take uh, questions directly from the chat room. So we're not gonna call on people's digitally, hand, digitally raised hand. Instead, if you could write your question um, in the chat room, I will be fielding those uh, for, for Andrea uh, shortly. And I'm looking at the chat room so far, it looks like we do not have any just yet, but which is great because I have like a dozen questions for you, Andrea. Uh, so I'm just gonna take pride of a place or the prerogative of the co-host in just inserting myself in the queue. Thank you again for this. Um, there was, and I know you have some thoughts on this from what I've read uh, in your in your work, but I was just hoping maybe to bring this out a bit in um, in part of the Q and A. Um, as, as we all, or as you and I know, and I think many, or perhaps many of the people in our audience also know that this is also very much a historical trajectory. Like this is not, I've, I, you put it, um, you said this type of violence uh, isn't kind of a, a glitch, it's a, it's a feature. Yeah. This is part of the system. Yeah. Um, and as such, I read that to mean that it's also part of a historical moment, that we are on a trajectory. Yes, the longer history of policing is that it was founded in the, yeah, in, you know, finding runaway um, enslaved people. Um, it has always served a function of policing people of color. But also there's a certain more recent historical shift as well. You mentioned broken windows, like James Q. Wilson's um, piece from, I think it was 1986. Yep. Um, you uh, 
uh, war on drugs clearly has shoveled, you know, plowed billions and billions of dollars into police and not just money too, but also military material and pers- and training as well. The, the militarization of our police force is certainly a feature, not a bug, a feature of this. Um, I wanted to ask you, and you also mentioned, and you also mentioned that you've been doing this work for going on three decades now. So I want to ask you, is there some, is there anything that you've seen that has changed in this longer period of, you know, the, the past two or three decades that seeing that things are different today than they might've been 30 years ago. So clearly the war on drugs has become more intense in the past 30 years. Um, and certainly broken windows policing has become more intense, you know, all the way down to stop and frisk. Um, perhaps there are also political and economic shifts that you might include in this as well, because policing doesn't happen in its own vacuum, right? Even though the way we have to critique it does, right? It's a black box. Like try getting police records. It's it's very difficult, as you know. But it's not. It doesn't occur in its own vacuum. So, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is: is there are there other f- factors outside of policing that which to which we should also attend as we're going for uh, reimagining what public safety looks like? Does that also come with a reimagination of what? our political and economic order looks like? No question. Um, I think what I've seen over the past 30 years is an increased um, reliance on criminalization as the default response to every single conflict need or harm. And we certainly see that now in the midst of the pandemic where instead of responding to, my goodness, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, How do we support each and every person to stay as safe as possible? Um, The country I was born in, Canada, um, has still uh, the opportunity to apply for $2,000 a month and the Canadian dollar is not that much less than the US dollar. So it's close to $2,000 US a month for income support. Um, The country my mother was born in and that I was in when the pandemic hit also offered income support for people to stay home. That is Jamaica, a small country with a much smaller economy, made sure that in the first week of the pandemic that I was there, people were being offered um, full support to stay home for two weeks straight um, and food and so on. And the only dispute that I saw about that was somebody saying, we're getting the same box of food rations if there's five people in the house as if there's one. How can we resort that? That was the glitch, (laughs) you know? So um, I just want to name that there's many different ways of approaching things. And the U S response was let's pass laws saying that we're going to fine you a thousand dollars. If you leave your house or 10,000, or we're just going to keep writing tickets and criminalizing people instead of giving people what they need. So I think that um, evolution such that in many communities, the only contact you have with the government or the only service offered by the state is police and a police officer. So when we hear in communities like, well, I don't know about defunding the police, we want more police. My sense from talking to people is what they're saying is, is we want more support. Mm -hmm. The only support you're offering us is something that's a little bit like Russian roulette. We'd like more of it, but maybe less chances that the Russian roulette will result in us being killed, you know, like that. And and I think we're having to expand our imagination. So that's one thing I've seen over the past 30 years. The other thing I've seen is, and this is something you, you see so much more through, um, and I just wanted to drop a link to a report from Barnard where to talk more about that. Um, the, the other thing I've seen is, um, and you see this more through the experiences when you look at women, queer and trans people, is an expansion of policing in the sense that it's not always people in police uniforms that are doing it. It can be child uh, welfare workers. It can be social um, assistance providers. We saw Jasmine Headley being beaten in a social assistance office, right, in New York City. It can be certainly healthcare providers. So when we say, oh, let's, you know, make this a public health issue and not a policing issue, for Black women and girls, that poli- public health has also always been a site of state violence. So, and that history teaches us that. So I've seen both of those things, expansion of policing um, and expansion of criminalization, um, in ways and surveillance, certainly in ways that are, are deeply concerning. I do also want to say on the realm of, sort of realm of hope, I have also never stepped out of my house before in Brooklyn and heard 15,000 people chant Black Trans Lives Matter. I've never watched a women's basketball game, which I'm a huge fan of, 
and seen people with jerseys on them that look like mine that say Breonna Taylor say her name. I have never seen celebrities uh, at the Emmys and the, like I've never seen so much conversation about a black woman who was killed by police, a black woman who was harmed by police, a black woman who was criminalized by police. I want to see us again, move off the starting line of visibility to action, but I have to acknowledge how far we've come um, and, and the possibilities that that opens up. So I'm super grateful. And the last thing I'll say, although I've never seen that many people talk about dismantling, defunding and abolishing police and thinking of new ways uh, or genuine and authentic and effective ways of creating safety in our communities. Um, and I've also not seen the amount of repression that we're seeing right now. I, you know, people, there were tanks in the streets last night in Louisville. Um, and uh, so I think both are true. We're at a point of tremendous possibility and a point of tremendous repression and violence. And, you know, how that balance shifts will depend on how well we organize and how well we learn from history going forward. So I just really am so grateful for historians and all you teach us about um, what we need to look for and how we need to organize going forward. We, we are grateful for you and, and the history that you're making. Um, so that, that, that appreciation is reciprocated. Thank you. Um, you know, what you were saying about reimagining policing and the Russian roulette, it's always struck me that you call 911 and you have, there's only three options, right? You get an ambulance, you get a fire truck, or you get somebody with weapons. And, but there's so many other ways that people might have needs than that. You know, like if you're not having a heart attack and your kitchen's not on fire, all you get is somebody with a gun. You don't get a social worker or anything like that. That leads to a question that is in our chat room by, and by the way, I'm gonna to apologize to everyone in advance if I butcher your name. So let's just take that caveat at the beginning. Um, Faye Marie Vassal is asking um, about how do we get, a, the, the challenge seems to be how we explain defund the police. I mean, I think those of us who have been following these politics for a while know what that means. Like that's not a new call, but it's new to many people. Um, our, the Democratic presidential candidate, before he was, I think the official candidate, when he first heard it, immediately said, I will never do that. Like didn't even read a you know, like a, a position paper, a policy paper, didn't even like look it up on Wikipedia. He just outright said, I'll never do that. He, people don't know the nuances and, and the, like the, the, the interrogation of policing that goes behind that. Faye Marie is asking us how do you pack, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing her question. Um, actually, maybe I should, I'm just gonna read it out right. How do, we have, how do we help communities hardest hit by a mosaic of social disparities to fully buy in to the need to defund police in communities across the country in the absence of police fixes for the social problems plaguing many communities which are over policed? In short, what's, how do we package this? Right. I mean, I think that the, you know, um, I think defund police is the right message in the economic crisis that we're in right now, right? Where in New York City, you know, we're slashing the summer youth employment program when people are <laughs> desperately in need of it. And the only thing that's not being cut in the budget is police. You know, in the first weeks of the pandemic, the governor is cutting Medicare, <laughs> like medical care. Um, and, and the only thing that's not being cut is police budgets. I think defund the police is the right message and what's missing is the part you know the fund the people invest in communities um that you know we're we're getting more clear that that's the second part of the message and it's not a one for one actually it's not just take you know one billion from the nypd and that's all we have to work with to meet new york city's needs we need to spend that one billion and more to meet new york city's needs to to, to genuinely create safety and i think that's the 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 message that um answers Marie's question, which is that what if, you know, you didn't only have three choices when you needed help, you could call and that you would actually have a choice because right now when you call 911, it's not guaranteed the cops won't show up if you're just having a heart attack in your living room. That's and, true. Right. And Absolutely. if they misunderstand the symptoms of your heart attack or your blood sugar failure or your sudden disorientation as something that's threatening to them, which they're far more likely to do if you're black, then you might wind up dead, right? Even when you call for something else. You know, Muhammad Ba, the, there was recently an anniversary of um, the killing of Muhammad Ba. His mother, Hawa Ba, called for help because her son was on a ledge. She did not want the police. She said, don't send the police. She said, send mental health workers. They sent the police and he died, you know, or he was killed. So we need a choice and we need a choice that actually meets the needs. And then the other thing that we need 
um, and this goes to this de-escalation question too, is we need to stop thinking about the moment of crisis and we need to start thinking about preventing the moment of crisis from happening. So right now, um, many of us who have mental health issues know how they know the signs, right? We know the signs that something's coming on, that, you know, whatever. But the way it's set up now is you're discouraged from telling anyone because stigma, because um, because criminalization comes, right? If you say, I'm feeling suicidal to your therapist or whatever, I'm starting to hear voices that I'm not sure are in the room or I'm whatever, the response is you will now be locked up in Bellevue for 72 hours and until someone deems that you're sane enough to leave. Under those circumstances, you're like, maybe those feelings will go away. Maybe I'll just wait and hopefully I'll feel better. Maybe something will happen or I don't have access to healthcare. I'm Medicaid, I'm undocumented. I'm, you know, my doctor sexually assaulted me last time I went, so I don't wanna go back. There's a million reasons why in that moment you might not seek the help you need. We need to change that. We need to make it so that, you know, services of all kinds, not forced medication, not necessarily even medication are available on every street corner in New York City in ways that are accessible to every community that are not transphobic, that are accessible, that are you know, black affirming, black central, non-judgmental, harm reduction based, such that everybody's mental health needs can be met for free in, in any way that it might be, I wanna go pray with someone, it might be I wanna have a cleansing ceremony, it might be I want um, someone to talk politics with me, it might be I want someone to just hold my hand for an hour, whatever it is, so that we don't reach that point of crisis. So we then aren't in a place where we have to call the police or in terms of de-escalation that we understand we all have relationship skills that help us recognize conflict and de-escalate it before we're at a point where, you know, it's, you know, both of us have a gun and we need to figure out how to de-escalate that, you know, and, yeah. and same with abuse and sexual violence. Like there's a whole culture shift. And I think that's the answer, right? If we invest in all of that, then we're not worried about what to do at the moment of crisis and, and what resources do we need? That's a long answer to that question, but hopefully helpful. No, no, uh, no, it, it certainly deserved a long answer because it's a complicated problem. Um, as you said, when you began and ended your talk. So no, it, it was not too long at all. Thank you. I'm gonna go to, we have a question from our own Nikita Shepard, uh, who asked for examples of types of scholarly research projects that concretely support movements to end police violence against black women and women of color. In short, what can academics and intellectuals do in this moment to support and be accountable to abolitionist and social justice movements? I'm trying to find um, the publication that we came up with over at um, Interrupting Criminalization uh, that addressed that. But basically, you know, we, there's so much we don't know about um, what brings particularly black women, girls, queer and trans people into contact with the criminal punishment system. Some things we know it's the same as everyone else, but some things we don't. Um, and so we need definitely research about that. But I do want to say that that research needs to be done um, with and in partnership with and, um, and really centering the agency and self-determination and um, visions and needs of people who are directly impacted. So, you know, this publication, uh, which talks about, you know, what we know about what's driving police contact and mass incarceration of women and LGBTQ people, and then also identifies what we don't know, which is much more, um, is a good guide, but to some places that we could do more research. Um, and this uh, participatory research guide that we created to do research with folks uh, who are incarcerated, for instance, survivors who are incarcerated, um, about how someone who's a survivor of violence comes to find themselves incarcerated and surviving the violence of incarceration, gives some good guidance about how to do that research in a way that um, supports agency and, um, and gives control to the people who are directly impacted. So that's two answers. And you said you're going to put that link in the chat. Oh, you just, just did. Okay, I, I see. Did. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um. All right. James Oglesby has a question uh, for you, and this is actually um, I may, uh, James, I may uh, expand your question so I can throw mine in there to piggyback. That's uh, the right of the of the moderator that, to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, James's question is. 
Uh, James just wrote back, he said, no objection. Thank you, James. Um, James's question is, what are the ways to integrate social workers and counselors into emergency response in order to mitigate the use of police, but still provide for these workers safety? Um, the part that I'm gonna add, James, uh, since you do not object, is also, you mentioned in a, in a just very brief sentence, like I think at the top of the Q&A, about the ways that even some of our putatively social service organizations are part of the carceral state. That it seems, I read in that statement, and maybe I'm imputing too much, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, that the carceral state isn't just the police. Um, and it's not just prosecutors and judges, but we also have to think about how, you know, I think you said child protective services, for example, CPS is one of those. So James's question is about how can we empower social workers to do the good work, but then I'm gonna, and since James, like you said, you didn't object, even though you might have to hear the question, I might also add, how can we think critically about the ways that people who are putatively, putatively supposed to be protecting us can also serve a policing function as well? So it's, James, I'm sorry, it's gonna be a two-part question. We can answer James's question first and then maybe mine. No, that, I think there's two things. One, um, yes, social workers are definitely part of the policing that I was talking about and can definitely be part of the, of the carceral state. And certainly in the scenario that um, James describes, um, if we send social workers out in emergency response, um, some oftentimes emergency responders want the police there, right? There's some who are like, absolutely, we don't want to go. Uh, with police. We don't want police anywhere near us. Mental Health First is a model, for instance, in Sacramento, where the goal is to keep police out of the interaction and also to keep people out of the hospital. That's their primary goal. When they go respond to a mental health crisis, they're doing everything in their power. They have a person who's actually assigned to keep the police away. But often, you know, police, firefighters, um, uh, EMTs consider themselves part of kind of the same brotherhood. Um, and sometimes social workers are in the same uh, category and then they're sort of you know calling each other and um, and supporting each other so this question of safety I mean you know we have to figure out how to ensure everyone's safety in those interactions but guarantee you that when the police are there um, there's not safety so for for anyone so I think that's the 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 challenge I think um, part of the challenge can be met by as I said making sure we're not at a moment of crisis that we're meeting someone, a social worker is meeting someone before um, things have hit a crisis point, and that also that we're not presuming that someone who is in the street sort of waving something, um, like Sahid Basel was, is necessarily um, a threat to anyone, and that we shouldn't assume that there's a need for protection in that moment, but really rely on people who know the person and know, you know, how to stay safe and engage them at the same time. So I think it's about changing the presumptions of the situation, changing the point of intervention, and recognizing that um, social workers are very much experienced and perceived and act in ways that are similar to police, and we have to sort of break that association as well. I dropped a link in the chat. Um, Cameron Rasmussen of Columbia yeah. Center for Social Justice is among a group of social workers who are um, naming the ways in which social workers play policing roles um, and also rejecting the notion that they should um, be replacing police in a way that turns them into police in when we're trying to think about defunding the police. So um, that appeal article sort of talks about that work, which feels um, really essential in this moment, that we wanna keep avoiding the notion that, and this is where the disinvestment um, emotionally and ideologically from policing is essential, because otherwise, sure, we'll move money from the NYPD into something else where the same thing is happening, someone's just wearing a different uniform, right? Um, or right. it's happening at a different institution. So that's why we have to continuously challenge ourselves to challenge the, valid, the values that we carry that produce policing as well, which include demanding the arrest of police officers, so. Right, well, that's what we saw with like the advent or the appearance of school resource officers. You exactly. know, we're in many, ju many jurisdictions, they're not, and they're not PD, they're, you know, the, the DOE, the Department of Education even though they're yeah. armed and like they act as police officers. So that carceral state is, is pernicious, particularly with the school to prison pipeline. Um, and thank you for bringing up Cameron. And, and I was, cause I also want to mention my many good friends and colleagues at the social work school that certainly um, who are very much invested in making social work part of the solution. So I was not at all implying in my question that social workers by, you know, per force 
are a problem. I think some of the roles that some of them have been forced into. They'll probably. be the first to tell you that. As camera. Yeah, I know. I know. I felt like I was on good basis of saying so, but I do also want to yeah. shout out, you know, raise up Cameron, um, yeah. Kathy Boudin, all those, all my other good friends, Cheryl. Um, um, oh my God, Cheryl Wilkins, and all my good friends over at the Social Work School. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, as an attorney, meaning you're the attorney, not me. Um, hmm. So, uh, progressive prosecutors, like what? Okay. So it's a oxymoron. Okay, all right. Just wanted to check. Sorry, you, it's, you, a, it's <laughs> a rant. It's a rant I have. So. No, um, I, I mean I can imagine, but I mean I think it's one that needs to be aired at this absolutely. point. Absolutely. No, um, I think yeah. there's a lot of conversation about that in terms of the Kentucky Attorney General and people being like, "Well, he's black, and he's talking about how pained he is to do the thing that is his mm, job to do, right?" Uh, and uh -huh. um, you know, prosecutors have one job: that's putting people in cages, and it's uh it they'll maybe change who they put in cages maybe you know a little bit less cages a little bit more programs but ultimately they serve a function and so like who's in it you can't buck the function at some point um unless you're becoming a prosecutor to close down the, the office of the prosecutor you know when tiffany caban was running for queen's prosecutor queen's da i was like you're an abolitionist are you running to close the office down because otherwise we're in a bit of a um uh, challenge. So I'm more grateful for the role she's playing now in, in running for office <laughs> and not trying to sort of play that role that um, I think ultimately we're seeing all the progressive prog progressive prosecutors, I can't even say the words because they don't go together, um, experiments sort of revealing um, the flaws in them and certainly the idea that representation um, addresses that issue um, is being exposed over and over again, including yes uh, yesterday. So, you know, I'm a defense attorney. There's no way I'm going to say there is such a thing as a progressive prosecutor, too. I'm just going to name that. So, um, yeah, I think what you said about it being an, an oxymoron of sorts, certainly, um, I didn't see that as being, you know, a rant or being, you know, polemical. Like, it, I mean, just structurally, it doesn't yeah. seem <clears throat> like it's, uh, like, that's really, like, the possibilities seem quite narrow. And we do have some you know, some, you know, fairly laudable examples, but they're hardly the norm. If anything, yes. they're kind of maybe the exception that might prove a rule right. of and sorts. And then they're still putting black people in cages. Find me a prosecutor yeah. not putting black people in cages and we'll maybe have a conversation, but. Yeah, I'll let you know as soon as I, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, put, we'll put the call out on social media. Okay. I'm, um, I'm looking for some other questions here. There's, um, there's one here from Jennifer that says, can you speak more to the emotional and ideological divestment from policing and how we can do this as everyday people. And I think that is, is the question, right? And I think it's one that my colleague, Mariam Kaba, um, answers, you know, in terms of um, just everyday um, actions. So she, thank goodness for her, put together a website for us called transformingharm.org that has a million tools for thinking about how you can do that in your everyday life. But it starts with our everyday interactions. And as, as educators and as students and as graduate students and TAs, that's the thing where you're like, the instinct is to police, right? To secure compliance, the instinct is to police, the instinct is to punish, the instinct is someone did me wrong, I'm gonna do something harmful to them. I'm not gonna invite them into accountability. I'm gonna make accountability a hard thing because admitting that you did something wrong could put you in criminal punishment, it could put you in exile, it could put you in, um, you know, a, a no unemployment situation. So the idea is to keep innocence, right? To hold on to innocence. And um, we have to create conditions where actually it's normal. I have a practice of inviting and taking accountability once a week because it's something I need to learn to do and to, to destigmatize. And, um, and that's just in my everyday reactions. I was on the call yesterday with a sister. I cut her off a couple times. I texted her and said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be cutting off a darker skinned black woman ever. Like, it doesn't matter how excited I was or how caffeinated I was or how annoyed I was by something someone else was saying. Um, I have to be in accountability about how that behavior um, is part of the same spectrum of behavior, admittedly at very different ends, that makes us devalue Breonna Taylor's life, you know, in the ways that people are in the streets about. So how do we um, look at how our individual actions are on those spectrums and how do we start to um, 
pull them back? And how do we examine our instincts around, for instance, what should happen to the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor and whether that's legitimizing the institutions that we're also trying to tear down at the same time. So in everyday interactions and in every moment, we can ask ourselves, am I building a world without police policing and a world that is genuinely about safety for everyone where every body matters and every, um, I'm not, there's not some all lives matter crap I'm saying, but literally I'm saying everybody in the Sonia Renee Taylor um, radical self-love sense that everybody matters. Um, am I building that world in this conversation, in this interaction, in this invitation to accountability for a student or a colleague, in this offer of accountability or taking, stepping into accountability with a student or a colleague or a family member or my child, God forbid, who I've been you know, locked up with since March and I'm like, you know, challenged in my parenting. Not for me, I'm lucky I don't, I'm not in that situation, but many of us are. Um, and so that's, that's, we can do it all of us every day. So what Mariam Kaaba tells us is the tools of abolition are in our hands. And that is an incredibly hopeful thing to remember in a moment where the overwhelm is overwhelming and looking everywhere we see, you know, signs of, of more violence and more violence coming and more uh, fear mongering and more despair. And, you know, Mariam's words, which I look at every day are let this radicalize you, not lead you to despair. And let's look at the tools that are in our hands every day that we can start to use to build the world we want. Um, and the more people do it, as emergent strategy teaches us, um, the more likely that that will happen. Yeah, Mariam is good for that. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with her where I wasn't thinking about it for like days and weeks later. Um, Can you imagine she, working with her? It's like yeah, so I, I envy I envy you, but then I also think of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and speaking of speaking of whom, um, the the link you put in, somebody tried it and said uh, you might have had it a little wrong. It's transformharm.org. I think oh, we had transforming Thank you so harm. Much. Yeah, so just for. And I just realized this is going to be recorded and the chat probably won't show up on the video. So for anyone watching this video later on, transformharm.org is the website that we were, to which we were just referring. I think, uh, Hillary, we're at, we're close to our 530 mark. Yeah. I, and I think that's when we end. Yes, that is when we end. Yeah. So in a couple of minutes, yeah. but I guess maybe one, and I don't see any other questions up here, but I wanted to ask you, uh, I have what, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Hillary. Yeah, so I mean, I just, I feel like it's a little off the conversation at this point, but one of the things that was so striking to me in your book, Andrea, was the way that controlling narratives and stereotypes um, are still so incredibly powerful in shaping not just the police's response um, to people of color and gender nonconforming people, but also how the public understands what police violence looks like. And so I just wondered if you could say a little bit more from your experience about the way that you see the media reinforcing um, those kinds of controlling narratives in ways that really do erase the erase women's of color's experiences, right? Because it's still, I mean, yes, as you, as we all know, there's, a, there's been a long distance traveled from totally invisible to now visible. But so much of the kind of um, police brutality that you talk about in terms of sexual violence and domestic violence and, you know, responding to calls for help and being met, you know, with gunshots, you know, none of that shows up um, in the way that, that this larger conversation, the media sort of, you know, puts out at us, uh, mainstream media anyway. And so I'm just wondering if you, you know, what, what you have to say about your experience with that. I mean, it never ceases to um, uh, devastate me. And I don't find it surprising. People are constantly trying to blame black women for stuff that happens to them, right? There are still people, including mainstream media that will play the police story about Breonna Taylor's killing and will say, um, you know, well, she shouldn't have associated with that drug dealing ex-boyfriend of hers you know, and somehow that's her fault or it's her fault because I don't know what, like, it's just, it, people tell me constantly in, you know, comments on social media that if Sandra Bland had just behaved and if black women just behaved, then they would still be alive. And I just, that's, that is, um, or if I just behaved, <laughs> you know, there's a lot that comes our way. And I think 
um, uh, it's about the media portraying these these stereotypes and these narratives um, and challenging them. And I know there's a lot more black women and women of color in media now who are challenging them, who are refusing them, who are refusing to repeat them or parrot them. You know, so much mainstream media is, you know, what Mariam calls, you know, they're stenographers for the police department. You know, they just yeah. take the police department press release and, and reprint it almost verbatim, you know, including right. last night about the police officers shot in Louisville, you know people just write down what the police chief said and that's it. And no one's asking any questions and people are making assumptions about who's responsible and why and what the consequence should be. And so I think the more we interrogate that in the ways that we produce our own media and the way that we challenge media that is produced, that we write our own narratives, think we're able to do that a bit more now. Um, and that we definitely link to that black feminist analysis of like, why did you think Jasmine Headley was out of control? What about what we know about or think about black women teaches you that? Um, and how can you dismantle that? So I'm going to drop one more link in the chat and I know we're out of time. Um, but Invisible No More uh, has a website and it has a study guide. And um, so I'm dropping the link to the study guide in the chat. Um, and if you go to the study guide um, on that page, there's like a booklet that you can download, but there's also like exercises that you can use. And I invite folks to use that with their students, but also with their family members. And there's ways you can draw controlling narratives. You can journal about controlling narratives. You can talk about how to interrupt them. And you can talk about how they play out in different incidents described in the book or in the media or in the news. So I invite people to really be engaged in that practice in the same way that I was talking about accountability or day to day, and then in conversation with people. Um, because I think that's the only way that we're gonna be able to make that shift um, in, in how we perceive black women and then how we respond to black women. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Good. This link, just for those of you watching the video later on or who are joining us by phone, is invisiblenomore.com slash study dash guide. Invisiblenomore.com slash study dash guide. Um, and actually, you were wrong again on that one, Andrea. I know, That's your I'm doing own it all book. memory. That's your book, too. I know. It's, we have a correction from Emma Scheinbaum who told us it is invisiblenomorebook.com slash study. <laughs> Dash guide. So <laughs> it's been a long day. Self, middle... self promotion isn't your thing, I guess. Is it? It's really not. It's really not. I mean, I, but what I do want is people to get the resources that have been created because there are so many for this conversation. Um, and so I hope that um, we can use them. And I hope that, you know, as folks in this room are coming into conversation with some of the folks who have big megaphones um, and are in this conversation in a, on a national lens, whether it's MSNBC or WNBA or whatever, that you can let folks know that there are so many tools available um, uh, as study guides yeah. to the book or through the In Our Names Network um, has a whole um, resource hub. And I'm going to try and um, you know figure out the, I'm sure somebody will help me figure out the correct link. Um, but there's a resource guide there that has all kinds of tools for conversation um, in community there or in students or in classrooms. Um, and so I hope folks will use them in every way they can to get us closer to that world that we want to live in where Brianna Taylor would be here today saying, you know, what a beautiful day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, this, you know, as we've said now several times, we could not have had a better guest at a better moment to reopen the Lehman Center. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and creating a space where I could be in this conversation today with you, Dr. Roberts, with you, Dr. Hallett, with all of you who have posed such amazing questions. And thank you so much, Nikita, also for all of your work to make this possible. I'm so grateful for all of you. Take good care of yourself. Okay. Take care. See you Bye. soon. Bye. Take care, everybody. Say hi to Sophia. I will. I'll see you in a little while. I'll tell you said hello. All right. Take, take care. care. Good to see you. Bye. Bye.